and welcome back. How are we doing? So, uh, as you can see right now, we're joined by a man who puts me to shame in terms of his beard. How about you introduce yourself? Uh, my name is Steve Cantwell. I'm an American stand-up comedian uh, known for storytelling. So, I grew... Yes? Go on, go on. Uh, see, I grew up in a, in a peculiar way. I was a Mormon preacher for a very serious Mormon preacher until... I was uh, 40 years old or so. I had, uh, um, I've had kind of a tough life. You know, I've, I've not had an, an easy life. My family actually emigrated from Ireland in the 1800s from Kilkenny and uh, joined the Mormon church and uh, took a, a sailing ship from Liverpool all the way to Louisiana, which was uh, how people got to, um, America before there was uh, railroads and, and Ellis Island and whatnot. So they showed up on the banks of uh, the Mississippi River essentially and built hand carts, which is just a basically a big push cart that you load all of your worldly belongings into and you and your family uh, just push that push cart in a westerly direction until you find Salt Lake City. And there would be, there were hundreds of, of people that were, that were uh, in that wagon train and they uh, they made their way to, to Utah, and so that and that's where I was born. I was born in this little town that my family uh, stole from the Indians in the 1800s, and uh, my my entire life I'd never really uh, done anything. I was and I was all set to live a, a kind of a sleepy life until I had a business partner that killed his mother-in-law for the life insurance money. And I turned him in and the government put me in witness protection. And I ended up in Alaska. They sent me to Alaska uh, just to get away from things while, they, while the trial happened. Uh, and while I was in Alaska as a Mormon preacher, um, I decided that I, my friend who was, a, was a, a sergeant in the army convinced me that it would be a good idea that uh, uh, he had been hearing about this thing called, um, um, I guess it was artificial marijuana. Do you guys have artificial marijuana in Ireland? Do you have, uh, they call it spice here. Yeah, we have spice. No? Do we? Okay. Well, so he had been hearing about spice. He didn't know it was called spice. It was when spice had just come out. And he had been hearing his soldiers talk about uh, this artificial marijuana and the army did not test for it. And so he asked me in a letter, he said, is this something that maybe the Mormon church has a blind spot about too, because he wanted to be able to, when he came home for Christmas, be able to uh, smoke marijuana, smoke fake marijuana with me. And uh, we'd have a great time. Our kids played together and we lived right next door to each other. Our wives were friends and he just thought that would be the greatest thing in the world if he and I could celebrate the fact that he was home for war for Christmas by going down into his gun room and smoking some marijuana together. So we planned this out over letters back and forth from Iraq. He tells me, "Go. it's legal in every head shop. Go into a head shop and just ask them for this art, this legal marijuana and get a big bong and get a get all the accoutrements and and then we'll have a, the greatest christmas ever so i do that i go into a into a head shop and i ask the head shop i say i'm looking for this stuff it's not marijuana it's perfectly legal my friend said they sell it in in, in all the shops and she said salvia and i was like yeah that sounds right so she sold me 20 times concentrate uh salvia do you guys know what salvia is have a clue Okay, well, it's a, it's an extra, it's an extract of a sage plant that the Indians uh, smoked here, and it's a, it's a powerful psychedelic, and I had no idea. I had, I thought that I was buying buying fake marijuana, and instead I bought a powerful psychedelic that was for some reason and still is perfectly legal in the United States. So I buy a giant Before bong. We go on any further. Yeah, uh, you were very quick to say. Your family stole land off the Native Americans. Not many Americans would be willing to say that. Yeah, well, I have all their journals, and unfortunately, it's absolutely true. I mean, we we pushed into the West at a time where there were no roads. We were the first white people out there, and uh, it started off as a very pleasant, a very pleasant, almost partnership 
with the Native Americans, and then it very quickly uh, turned into a very ugly um, situation. You know? Yeah, ugly it was, definitely. Yeah. Um, and, now, and unfortunately, we, they were responsible for the extermination of an entire an entire uh, civilization of, of Indians that were in North America at that at that particular yeah. time, you know. And I struggled that for a lot of years, the guilt of that. But then I, I just, you know, I've told this story so much, I really had to kind of compartmentalize that and just say, well, that was them, and I'm just the guy. Yeah, you said that wasn't them. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just the guy telling the story. <laughs> yeah, and it's telling the story is the best thing you can do. Like even yeah. with a lot of things to do with we're looking back on history these days, very yeah. in depth, and there's no one alive. Well, mostly there's no one alive who was involved in these things. And yeah. all we can do is tell the stories of what happened. But yeah. you brought up uh, being a Mormon. I don't, Thomas, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think we have Mormons in, in Ireland. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm technically and not allowed to correct you, Jared. It's in my contract. <laughs> we, we, do, we don't have Mormons in Ireland, as far as I know. I, I think you do. They're, 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 they're actually not called Mormons specifically. They call themselves the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And they, they just, you know, two guys in white shirts usually ride, ride bicycles around and knock on your door and talk to you about the Book of Mormon. And I, I've known people that have served their mission in Ireland is the reason I, I say that. I've, I've, been, I've been not lucky. <laughs> well, maybe lucky. I don't know. I've never met them. I live in a very small town. Um, but could you, you just in? give us a quick uh, brief on that? Uh, County Offaly. Okay. Uh, the Mormon Church was started in the 1800s by a 14-year-old farm boy named Joseph Smith, who made up a story that he found a that an angel showed him where a golden Bible was buried on his property, that he was able to dig up that no one was allowed to see except for him, and uh, God told him that he could have as many wives as he wanted, essentially, and if and if it was cool with all of his friends, then they were allowed to have as many wives as they wanted to as well. And so essentially it was a sex cult that this kid started in the 1800s as a way to try to get out of manual labor. And the, the interesting thing out of, about cults and something that I've learned about getting out of the Mormon church is at the top of all of these religious organizations, there's usually an atheist in charge because only an atheist would make up stories. Only somebody who knows there's not a God would make up stories about having hung out with him. Hmm. So that's a, but they say he sent emissaries to all parts of the world but even back in the 1800s and they sent missionaries to to Kilkenny County Ireland which is where they encountered the Cantwell family in, in where James Tr what's that well what county Kilkenny 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 yeah. oh all right I did I didn't know sorry I thought it might sorry. have been <laughs> smaller at this like, there is when like, people say it here they say it with such a thick accent it's probably not even what it sounds like everyone else no, no that's fine yeah no <laughs> Kilkenny okay. yeah okay. Right. yeah so they they emigrate uh they, they go to Liverpool to get to, to find passage on a ship and then they find passage over there and uh find their way in, into the Salt Lake Valley which is in Utah which nobody nobody lives there and they slug it out with the Indians uh James Sherlock is my ancestor he his whole family makes it on the journey um, um, without incident, and then his first week in the in the camp of Salt Lake, he's building a sod house for his family, and he designs the chimney incorrectly. And his first night that they have a fire in the house, it, the chimney starts fire, and everyone gets out except for his wife, and his wife dies in the blaze, and um, uh, he can't forgive himself. He, he feels like he has dragged her into this adventure, dragged her out of her comfortable home in Ireland and has has killed her out in, in this wilderness of America. And so he, um, he goes a little bit mad with grief. He's got all these kids that he can't take care of, including a, a pretty newly born baby. So Brigham Young, who was the head of the Mormon church at that time, takes his kids and you know gives them to different families who we can think take can take care of them and he sends my great great grandpa up to this next township over in this next valley where there's a terrible indian fight going uh, because my grandpa is suicidal 
and he um, he just wishes to die in the service of his god. And so Brigham Young obliges him and sends him up to this terrible Indian war where he goes fully expecting that he's going to die. But they don't die. You know, they they uh, they build an Indian fort, and uh, and over the course of probably a decade, they they have this terrible war and uh, do terrible things, and uh, uh, live through it. So at the end of this time, they they have this whole valley that they, these twenty or so men can can divide up amongst themselves, and my family is one of those the beneficiaries of that land grab, and so. That, that land just gets passed on from father to son and subdivided amongst all the children with every generation. And I find myself in a situation in this little town that I grow up in where I'm literally within a few blocks of every member of my family, both sets of grandparents, both sets of great, set, great grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, everybody. So it's like I grew up in Cantwell town, you know? Yeah. But nobody ever left. Nobody, nobody ever leaves uh, that that this little comfor comfortable burg that we're at, and uh, until until I do. And okay. I've never been back. Uh, that's, that's a lot to take in. Yeah. Uh, that uh, that's like that's rough. Uh, and have you spoken to your family since? Oh yeah, yeah. And that you you know when I quit the Mormon Church which is, just, you know, we'll get into how that happened. Yeah. But uh, they went through a rough patch with it. There were several, there are several members of my family that don't really talk to me anymore and have kind of disowned me. They all had a rough period with it, but uh, two of my brothers and my sister found their way back to having a, a regular relationship with me now on, on the new terms that, that my life exists under. And I just want to, Go back to the Irish heritage part. Yeah. Did they leave during the, the famine? No, I think they or missed before. the famine. They, they left before the famine. Okay. Yeah, they, they, and they, they just narrowly missed the famine and they narrowly missed the civil war in the United States. Yeah. Well, so they didn't I get too stripped into the army. Yeah. They were lucky in that regard, <laughs> in both those regards. Um, but you have to, have you really taken out with the story with the Native Americans and the land grab? Uh, like, it's it's so bad. <laughs> but okay. stuff like that happened all over the world. Europeans were were doing it to Europeans for hundreds of years. Yeah, and then they and found they, other parts of the world to do it too. Yeah, um, and the and the Irish were victimized for you know centuries. Uh, and one of uh, the first countries to experience colonialism was Ireland with the yeah. Protestant uh, Protestant uh, what were they called Thomas goddamn British yeah, that's it <laughs> they, 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 they set up uh, colonies they didn't call them colonies though I don't know what, um, come on ah shit man use your brain oh, you, haven't, you haven't spoken on a podcast yeah man well technically you say I'm you know, under the contract no Right. <laughs> you know, the, the plantation is what they call it. That's it, the plantation. There we go. That Shit. was a that was a horrible part. No, uh, no buttery. Yeah, that was rough. Uh, well, they get indentured indentured servants out of out of the the Irish people. Especially. Yes, and some people have the gall to say like that that was nothing. Like, yeah. well, I, I know when people talk about the Irish slavery thing, there's a lot of mixed mixed feelings, but these people were basically forced into it and just because it had an ending didn't mean it wasn't periodic slavery and it lasted a millennia it lasted a yeah. it was a thousand years of, of being subjected and think of the hopelessness of that you know if you were born irish in the last thousand years that you were you had no no choice no help no, no hope essentially you were just basically uh yeah a yeah. servant yeah, the english were i've been here for I've been, yeah, I have been here for a long time. Mm. But anyway, we're past that. Yeah, we are. <laughs> Thanks, fuck. Uh, like, not just Europeans did this stuff. Um, you know, the ancient uh, Chinese. Genghis Khan. My similar lad. stuff. Genghis Khan. Uh, the Ottoman Empire was absolutely terrible at it. Uh, and so on. So. Well, let's go back to you. Um, yeah. Let's go back to that. Is it were Salvia? You, at the moment where you said that you got this what, extract from like Sage or Salvia, something? Salvia, please. So, yeah. 
So, uh, so I had bought this stuff called salvia, thinking it was just going to be a mild version of marijuana. And I'd never in my entire life, Mormons are not allowed to uh, have stimulants or drugs of any kind. They're not allowed to um, have coffee or even tea. Uh, just Mormons mo tea. basically just keep themselves completely, um, drink water and milk essentially is what I grew up my entire life drinking. Oh, bro, that it, sucks. Shit. Yeah. <laughs> Were there any loopholes? No. I, I had, at this point in my life, I had never been intoxicated in any way, not even having had uh, painkillers. So when I would, uh, I broke my ankle once, and the strongest thing that I had was ibuprofen. So I'd never even felt that feeling before. And... And my friend who, you know, did not grow up Mormon and who was a hardened, you know, army sergeant, mm -hmm. uh, he was fascinated by that. And I was fascinated by the fact that he, he had used to smoke marijuana when he was a boy before he joined the army. And he would tell me stories about smoking marijuana and he would get wistful about those days. And I would, you know, it sounded amazing to me, but I was, I was precluded from being able to do it because of my religion. And at this time, I'm a very serious Mormon. I'm a Mormon preacher. I have a, I have a congregation. I have this big, beautiful family. I've been married for 21 years, you know, uh, to, to, a, to a, a Mormon, my Mormon wife. And that's just the life that I'm going to, I've, you know, I've built my own house in Alaska, uh, where I was sent for this, um, witness protection thing that trial is long was long over but i loved alaska and i was staying so and that's kind of the intersection in my life that i'm at 40 years old and i feel like a virgin of life you know i just uh, never done anything yeah so so i go and get this uh this gear and uh it's christmas day our kids all open their presents our wives go into the kitchen to get lunch ready and he gives me the high sign and we go down into the basement to where he has this gun room. And that's where I've uh, wrapped up this present for us. And we open the present together. Uh, we load the bong with, with frosty water and, uh, and, and load this huge bowl piece full of this black tar looking salvia stuff that just came in this foil wrapper. And um, I just, you know, a lot of my friendship with him was just basically proving I think to him that I was man enough to be friends with him in some ways, because he was like this, this army sergeant that had been everywhere and was killing people in the war. And he was this badass, and I was this, you know, Mormon guy. And so in some ways, I, I think I volunteered to go first because, you know, I didn't want to go small dicks to the salvia party. And so I volunteered to go first. I hit the bowl piece with the with a micro torch and just took the biggest hit that I could possibly do. I'd seen I've been watching videos on people taking bong rips and I just had hit a big manly bong rip and held it and then I felt the floor. And the best way to describe it is I felt like my molecules and the molecules in the floor no longer had anything to do with each other. And I just slid right through the floor of his basement. And there was a short sensation of falling. And then there was a sensation of falling up. And I um, fell up into a person. I found myself on the, on, the, on the deck of this little water skiing boat, coughing up water. And there were a bunch of guys surrounded me on the, on the deck of this water ski boat who were trying to sit me up and pounding my back and saying, man, we thought you drowned, you know, and we're, and, but I didn't know any of them. I was suddenly outside. I was, it was warm. It wasn't Christmas anymore. And I was just this, what I thought that that's what this salvia trip was. So I was just looking around and amazed at how real everything was. I mean, it was as real as this. It was just, the water was wet. I didn't know any of these guys, but they all seemed to know me and they thought that I'd been water skiing and that I was this different person. And I looked down and I looked slightly different, but it's hard to tell. And, uh, and I just start laughing. I just start laughing and telling all of these guys that none of this is real and that I'm having a salvia trip and I'm, you know, 
I'm in uh, witness protection in Alaska and I'm in my friend's basement and it's Christmas time and the, I'm saying this stuff to these guys and as I start to tell them this stuff, they get this very worried look on their face and they j they're just like, holy shit. And they, they, they take the water ski boat back to the, to the dock. They don't even take the time to load it onto the trailer. They just, we, we just all jump into their pickup truck and they drive me to this urgent care facility where I go in and they tell the doctor they're like, hey, our friend was water skiing with us. You know, he fell off his board and was floating face down for a while. By the time we could circle back with the boat and pick him up, he probably had his face underwater for about three minutes. And now he doesn't remember any of us. He says that, you know, he lives in Alaska and that he's Mormon and that he's in witness protection and that, and that it's Christmas time. And the doctor's like, huh, well, that's, you know, so they shine lights in my eyes and they have me cross my legs and hit my knee with a rubber hammer and they test all of my, you know, just they test my blood oxygen and they just do all of this, the rudimentary things to make, listen to my lungs. And the, the doctor says, well, he's fine medically and true medical amnesia is, is really rare, almost unheard of. So he'll probably remember everything by morning. So take him home and put him to bed. He hasn't got a concussion. And if it, and if it persists, call us tomorrow. So they take me. I'm still freaking, it's been hours now at this point. It's been hours. I'm one, I'm just, I can't believe how long this salvia trip is lasting. I'm like wondering what's happening, you know, in Alaska, you know, what, what my family is saying. Am I missing Christmas dinner? Are my Mormon, is my Mormon family freaking out because I've been, surely they've discovered now that I've been doing drugs if it's gone on for five hours. So my new friends, none of whom I remember, but all of whom claim that they went to school with me my entire life take me back to this shitty little apartment that I apparently live in and use the keys that were in my jeans to unlock the door, take me into this little apartment where there are my belongings, you know, with, with clothes that fit me, pictures of me, with some of them with these guys on the wall, old yearbooks, and they just say, okay, we'll see you tomorrow, try to remember us, ha ha ha, and they leave, and I just sit there on on the couch and wait for the salvia trip to end. You know, I'm looking through old yearbooks, looking at pictures of myself and it's, but it's real. Everything is, nothing is psychedelic. There are no trippy, yeah. you know, there are no tracers. There's no colors. It's just this normal, it's just a normal fucking Tuesday. That's fucking scary. Uh, and I live in Tyler. Tyler, Texas is the name of this town. It's a place that I, it's a real town, but I had never been there before. Yeah. And it was just, and I just lived in Tyler, Texas. So I drift off to sleep on the couch, looking at yearbooks. I wake up to the sound of pounding on the door. And the, so this, the same friend that dropped me off the night before comes in and says, you didn't come to work. Come on, get dressed. We got to take you to work. He throws some clothes on me, t throws me in his pickup truck and takes me to this farm where I work uh, supervising migrant labor. And uh, I just stand there with a clipboard in my, uh, in my hand all day long with a bemused look on my face, just telling everybody who will listen that I'm not real and they're not real and this isn't really happening. And I live in Alaska and I'm Mormon and, and I'm in witness protection. And so this, all this crazy shit. And they all just kind of try to laugh it off. But I'm starting to get, uh, you know, worried that... Um, it's been a really long time. It's been now 24 hours since I've been in this trip. I'm thinking I must be in the hospital in real life. I must have had some sort of a reaction. Yeah. So he takes me home from my from my day of work and puts me to bed again. And I sit I sit there on top of the bed, just worried, wanting it to be over, like right now, worried that what's going on, worried that I'm in a coma. Did I die? Is this limbo? You know, because I'm a very religious person at this at this point still in my life and just before we, we move on thomas can you look up uh what was it salvia salvia and pull it up uh yeah okay this is this is a lot yeah uh, obviously Fuck. jesus man <laughs> and got, got you know some... you know like when you're when you're dreaming they say like uh, name a time in a dream ever you've seen your phone do you have a phone in this? Yeah. Okay, Everything. Phone. I paid a phone. I fucking voted. I paid taxes. I had a fucking cable bill. I, Mr. President. Uh, 
it was it was Barack Obama at the time, and everything. And I and I would spend my I would spend as as the days turned into weeks, and you know, and I lived every minute of every day in this salvia trip for eight years. Look up salvia trip. Yeah. Yeah. And at this point, I had never heard of salvia. So I had, if I had ever like done what you're doing and looked up, there are stories on the internet of people getting stuck as a coat of paint on a barn for 30 years. And they feel every single day of that 30 years being stuck as a coat of paint. So in some ways I got off easy, but I didn't know anything could last that long at this point. I think it's just, you know, a mild form of marijuana. And I think there's no possible way that I'm supposed to be, it doesn't, it shouldn't last eight years. Did you ever think of like trying to locate yourself? Like, yeah, like, did you ever think of trying like, to go to Alaska? Uh, I was, yeah. Yes. All of those things. I, I, I tried all of those things. I tried calling my house. I tried calling my old high school. I tried calling, you know, because my family had been in that little town for generations. So at one point I actually loaded my ass into an old Pinto and drove the thousand miles or so to Smithfield, Utah from Tyler, Texas, and went into this little town fully expecting to see the, the town that I'd remember for my entire life, you know, a whole hill on the graveyard with, 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 uh, with uh, Cantwell, with Cantwell names on, on the tombstones. And none of that was, was, was accurate. I, I went into that town and it was exactly like going into a town that you'd never been to before. I was just, none of it was, was, was the way I remembered it. The high school was named something different. I went into the high school and asked them if I'd ever, if, if there was any record. My dad had been a school teacher at that school. They had no record of him. Uh, so it's it just, so it was, was kind of like, it was kind of like you were someone else and your entire family never existed. Yes. So it was exactly as my new friends in Tyler, my, that my old friends in Tyler were telling me, they said, you had a near drowning incident. You have brain damage, my friend. We have known you your entire life. You've never been Mormon. You know, your family were Methodists and uh, you were never in witness protection. To our knowledge, you've never been to Alaska. That's just some sort of a fantasy that happened when you were without oxygen. and. Everybody in this town told me this same story. Uh, you, it was, it, everybody at the grocery store would come up to me and say, I know you don't remember us because of your accident, but I was your teacher in second grade and you were a nice little boy and my name is Mrs. Eskelson. And you know, so everybody in this town to a person was telling me that they had remembered me for the last 40 years of my life. And faced with that, as evidence and as and all of the evidence that I could find on the internet everywhere else there was no evidence of the Steve Cantwell that was involved in witness protection and there was no evidence of my family members you know so eventually at about the four year mark I slowly decided that I had imagined my entire family and my entire life and that I actually had brain damage and it caused me to forget all of my friends in this town called Tyler that loved me very much and were very patient with my, with my brain damage. But I, you know, rather than just trying to push everybody away because I thought that they were imaginary, at about the halfway mark somewhere, I started to hang out with my friends and to take them up on offers to go camping and to, you know, we, we would play, we, 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 we had this little, they would play guitars and, and stuff like that after work and we would just sort of jam and it sort of turned into a band and i like when i when i then when they dropped me off in my apartment in tyler there was a ukulele on the couch and i had not played ukulele before this but when i picked up the ukulele i knew how to play the ukulele my fingers knew the places to go on the strings i didn't know the names of any of the chords but my fingers knew where all the chords were, and that was trippy. But I eventually started playing the ukulele with them after work, and they and we would we formed a, a band called Electric Watermelon, and we would, I mean, it was it never turned, you know, nothing ever came of it. But we would play 
mostly backyard parties. We played a couple of weddings and the, um, you know, we played that we played at the fair and the rodeo one time. So, but it was, but it was mostly it was that camaraderie. It was the fact that I was accepting the fact that I was actually in Tyler, Texas, and that I was not trying to get back to this family that I thought that I had in this marriage of 21 years. I've just accepted the fact that I never got married. I'm just hanging out with all of my friends from high school that also never got married. We all worked at this apple orchard together and that just became my life. And so the last four years of my time in, in, in Tyler were actually quite nice. I, 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 sometimes I would quietly mourn my family. It would always puzzle me. I would, I would sit, at night in my house sometimes and watch old movies and television shows that I remember watching with my family. I had specific memories of these old movies and it puzzled me that I could remember the plot line for this movie and remember, you know, sitting there next to my daughter during a, during a Disney cartoon and I could remember listening to her laugh at this movie, but I was trying to wrap my head around the fact that my daughter was imaginary and that my brain was just remembering, you know, Mulan because I'd seen it before my accident. So that kind of shit always, always fucked with my head a little bit, but, uh, um, eventually I just kind of learned to just accept it as a phenomenon and just kind of shrug my shoulders. Cause there, and I spent all, and I also knew a ridiculous amount of things about Mormonism, which I could not contend with. You know, I knew all, because all the things that I knew about Mormonism with the secret handshakes and the magic underwear and stuff like that, those are things that Mormons don't really talk about. Uh, yeah, every Mormon always wears uh, magic underwear that goes from their knees to their elbows. You wear it 24 hours a day. It's supposed to protect you from bullets, knives, evil spirits, werewolves, anything. And uh, I spent my entire life wearing magic underwear. And I looked that up on the internet when I was in Tyler, and that was exactly accurate. And all that handshake stuff was exactly accurate. And all of the detailed knowledge that I had about the history of the Mormon church was accurate. And so that was a real fucking head scratcher for me. I, I just want to say, for anyone who's like scratching their head right now, just, just think about putting yourself in that situation. You know, you got, you're off with the lads. You know, you got, got a little doob of some sort and one massive pull and suddenly you wake up, you know, you, you, you have these people pulling you out of the water and they're super concerned. You you sound like you're a crazy person to them. And then the whole process of going to the doctor, living a life, years, you know, as you said, that just sounds Eight crazy. Eight years. How did you, how did how did you wake up? Like how, like how did that happen? Did... Well, I think we'll get to that. Yeah. So I, 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 so while I'm looking up the Mormon church and wondering at how I have all this knowledge about the Mormon church, I look a little bit further and I look into the, you know, cause most of the people that are talking about the secret handshakes and the magic underwear are people that have left the Mormon church. And so they've got all this realistic but negative shit to say about it and so for the first time in my life there's, I don't know anybody around me that's Mormon so I have the courage I think to really look at some of those uh, viewpoints for the first time have knowing that no one's going to look over my shoulder you know if I my, my logic is if I really am Mormon and I'm looking where God has told me not to look on the internet I'm not really doing it because I'm ha imagining this. And if I'm not imagining this, then I'm not really Mormon. So with that logic scale, it just allowed me to, to read everything about the Mormon church. And I convinced myself that, you know, if I ever had been inv inv involved with the Mormon church, that it was probably a mistake. And I convinced myself that it was a cult. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, I go on living my life in Tyler, Texas, playing an electric watermelon, hanging out with my friends, do a better job at my, at my job. My boss gives me a raise because, you know, he thinks that I've like pushed beyond my, my uh, brain damage and I'm able to, to, to be more helpful around the farm. And so I just lived this very normal life for the last four years. And my last day in Tyler, I'm actually walking across the park with a bucket of Kentucky Fried Chicken under my arm. I can see my friends in the distance. Uh, 
hanging around this picnic table talking and I'm walking towards them. And for no reason, just I get that same feeling where my feet don't have the molecules in my body, don't have anything to do with the molecules on the ground. And I just find myself falling through the grass in the, in this park. And there's the same short sensation of falling. And then that sensation of falling up. And I find myself on the floor in my friend's gun room. And I am having a full seizure. I'm just like, you know, and my uh, wife is behind me holding onto my head and my arm. And then, and the, the room is spinning around me. And then I feel it spin and then slow down. And then everything just sort of locks into place molecularly is the best way I can describe it. Yeah. And then suddenly the seizure stops. My, my friend who has got a, he's got a scared look on his face is dialing the phone at, the, at this moment, dialing 911 for an ambulance to come. And my wife says, uh, hang up, I think, I think he's coming out of it. And I came out of it and I just, I just exploded crying. You know, I just, just, I just could not believe the fact that I was back. I was actually in Alaska. And my, my wife, who I thought I had imagined, was there holding me. And uh, I could hear my kids outside in the hallway saying, what's wrong with daddy? You know, uh, but they sounded very real. And I, so I, I had pissed myself all over the floor, uh, but I just started blabbering to both of them and telling them this story of the last eight years of my life. And oh my God, I thought I imagined you. And I'm just talking a million miles an hour. And she's like, you know, shut up, you're ruining Christmas. I can't believe you were down here doing drugs. And so my friend l lends me a pair of, of sweatpants and lets me go into the, into the guest bathroom and wash the piss off of me so that I can come up and eat Christmas dinner with the family. I and doubt I you were very about, hungry. I was <laughs> like I hadn't eaten in eight years. But so I just told her, I told her this whole story while I was showering the piss off of myself. Uh, but I was, I was still so out of it that I, I got out of the shower and was toweling off when I realized that I'd actually also shit myself a little. And so I shit their towel too. And so I'd like pissed on the floor and shit their towel and had a seizure and was, and then woke up weepy, super weepy about how I loved everybody and I couldn't believe this. And so, and then she gets me under control, gets me dressed into some, into some borrowed clothes. I go upstairs and it's like a Christmas carol. You know, it's Christmas. My, my children who I haven't seen in eight years are gathered like angels all around the, uh, around the, the dinner table. And I just, start to cry as soon as I come in the room and I'm walking around and petting their hair. I'm not telling them the story at this point, but I'm like kissing them and making a fucking ass of myself. And, uh, you were still a little high at this point, were you? I don't think that I was high. I think I was just, cause you, uh, you know, it felt like I was within a few minutes that I was back with it, had all my faculties, but I was still just shocked by the fact yeah. that I was back. And that all of this was real. And I guess I really do live in Alaska. And I guess I really am Mormon. And that threw me. I, the last thing I expected that I was going to be more, when we left there, I told my wife, I said, hey, one of the things I figured out on this trip is that I don't want to be Mormon anymore. I want us to get out of the Mormon church. I don't want the kids to grow up Mormon. So I walked into that gun room, a Mormon preacher. And by the way, total lapse time, they said, that I was, that I was having this trip. My friend and my ex-wife, their best estimate, 45 seconds. 45 seconds of having a, a seizure on the floor equated eight years, every minute of eight years in an imaginary version of Tyler, Texas. But, I, but the crazy thing is I walked in there as a Mormon preacher and walked out as an atheist. And we immediately sold our now, house, I sold have our to business. Ask. Yeah. Okay, you went in there a Mormon, but after everything you experienced in that trip, how could you come out an atheist? You have to have thought something after that. Maybe Mormonism wasn't the right way to go about it. Maybe there was something different. Have you ever thought about that? Well, I have since come around to that way of thinking. But I, I have to say the place that I was at 
when I came out of that gun room, the dark place that I had been in, in, in Tyler, Texas, feeling like there was, I did not feel at a certain point, I was confident that no just God would ever allow this to happen to me. And I felt completely ignored by God. And so while I was in Tyler, I convinced There's myself that your there was, yeah, like Jesus got crucified. Yeah, it was a test of my faith and I for sure failed, you know. <laughs> That's fair. Um, oh, I had a question. It's, it's definitely up to your interpretation. Like, that is fucking crazy. Oh, yeah. Have you ever tried... to talk to people with crazy experiences, but none like that. Have you ever gone back to Tyler? Like... You, real you know, Tyler? Yeah, yeah. Nah, yeah, real Tyler. Yeah. It's nothing like the way I remembered it. It's much bigger. There are no mountains around it. Uh, they don't grow apples. You know, they just, they have nothing. It's, 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 there was nothing about my, my version of Tyler was anything similar to the real Tyler. So it was just, I think my brain just needed a blank space on the map where it could just put stuff up there without any objections from, my, from myself. And just Tyler was a town that I knew existed and had never been to. So I think that's why. Tyler, mm -hmm. to, to be truthful, Tyler kind of looked like a different version of the little town that I grew up in. It was about that size. There were kind of mountains around it like that. You know, the streets changed a little bit, but, you know, that was essentially. Thomas, I think we need to forward this guy on to Lisa Scott. <laughs> <laughs> she, she's like a psychotherapist. Oh, yeah. Uh, like well, she does a podcast as well. I think you would have an amazing conversation with her. I'm sure I would. Because like you're I'm reflecting sure. on like this place was similar to you, like your childhood home and so on. So I think you have a great conversation with her. Cool dog, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah man, I have, But you know, so I think it's but I, it was, it, it, though it wasn't real, though, though the experience, I, I mean, I've had every... I've had every opinion about this, by the way. When I, when I first came back, I thought that I had maybe slipped into a different dimension. I thought maybe, you know, the, the current version that I, the, that I believe in now is I think that possibly all of this is imaginary, that this, all of this is an illusion around us. And, uh, and I, you know, I'm sure I'll change my mind about that at some point, but the thing about it is, is no matter whether it was real or fake, it had the ability to change my life in such a way that nobody in my family in seven generations has had the ability to escape from this little path that we were on. And, you know, I walked in there never doubting, you know, having absolute crystal clear faith that, uh, that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was the, tr was the true church and that there was a Mormon Jesus in heaven watching over me and, you know, making sure that I always wore my magic underwear and that I never, never masturbated. And that was, and I, that's how I had spent 40 years. But when I, 45 seconds on the gun room floor and I woke up having a completely different opinion, I wanted to get away from Alaska as quickly as I could. I kind of took a, took a, um, a page out of the witness protection manual, kind of. And we just, we sold our house we sold our business and we moved to Hawaii within a few months. We, and we just left our, we, we left our phones at the airport and we got new phones when we got to Alaska and we didn't give any of the Mormons our addresses or our, or our phone numbers. And we just tried to live a very secular and they very, and then that, that was, that was a bitch because you, you're not, you're not prepared in the first time you drink alcohol and you got a bunch of teenage kids and it, it was just a fucking mess. I mean, my wife and I started, you know, having threesomes. We bought a sailboat and started having threesomes. We need, neither of us have ever had sex with anybody but each other. And so we just making up for lost time right there on Waikiki Beach in Hawaii. And we, we would just go get tourist girls to fuck us on our sailboat. And six months of that, she left me for an Eskimo guy. And then I was in Hawaii alone. Took took the kids and the money and I uh, I basically had to live on this on the old sailboat that we were using as a threesome vessel and just had to live I lived on that sailboat for 10 years in Hawaii and just sort of 
found myself, just sort of reformed myself. You know, I had been in business before and I had made money. And that's what I thought the measure of a man was, is, you know, how much money can I make for my family? And yeah, uh, a lot of men, especially towards your generation and further on, you know, a, lar a large cause of depression in those age groups is because they get injured, they can't work, or they retire. Like, they, they don't know what to do. If they're not providing money, or if they're not the bread makers, they could fall into depression, lose what they feel like their meaning is. Yeah. I had no idea what even made me happy. I had never, I had never dared to even ask myself a question like, what, what would I like to do for a living? What would give me pleasure? And I can't tell you how many years that took for me to, to answer that. It took losing everything, you know? I, and, to, and I eventually found out that I liked making people laugh. And so I started doing stand-up comedy in a serious way. Which you still do to this day, right? I still do to this day, yeah. How, how many years are you doing stand-up? Six, seven, something like that. So you're a, you're a veteran. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, it's a tough slug and it's, there's no, there's no money involved in stand up comedy. You know, it's poverty, 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 millions of dollars is essentially what, what mm -hmm. happens. So, you know, if, but that part of it doesn't bother me. The money, the money part of my life, I think was never for me. What do you think that's? I think most I people would disagree. I, I think that I, I think that I viewed myself as a human battery. I viewed myself as the, as a life support system for my family and that I wasn't allowed to have wants and make myself happy. I had to make sure everybody had enough money for college. Mm -hmm. And I stopped believing that way. I stopped thinking of myself for my family. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is, man, this is a loss. <laughs> We've never had this kind of conversation before. That's definitely a first. It's an incredible story. Uh, I mean, you know, when, when you said to, to us at the start, like, you've had a rough old spot of it, you weren't lying. <laughs> oh, no, it's been, a, it's been a fucking shitty life, for sure. You know, I, I haven't told you a tenth of it. Um, to a certain extent, even now, my life seems imaginary. It's gotten more imaginary as the years go by. You know, I'm, it just seems, it seems ridiculous the fact that I am a stand-up comedian, you know? And that, that part of it just seems like the kind of thing you would imagine if you were hit on the head. If it makes you feel any better, I'm pretty sure I'm real, so. I'm <laughs> pretty sure you're real too. That's what everybody fucking says, dude. That's what everybody says. <laughs> it's not the first time I heard this. Yeah. Uh, That's uh, the hell of it is. We all think we're real. Yeah. Uh, Shit. You Until thought you were Saudi. real. In all fairness, you know, you thought you were real for, for eight, you know, eight years. You were made to believe that you were real. And yeah. Um, Just Thomas, if anything's convincing me that none of this is real, it's that fact you're not here. Yeah. 100%. Like, like, it's, it's, like, it's like the human mind couldn't imagine what you would look like so <laughs> yeah. just imagine like a really good looking model but like time yeah. yeah you'll always be a cartoon pint in my mind thomas <laughs> yeah jeez so obviously you're in stand-up now when was the first time you said okay i want to be a comedian you know, Mormons are not supposed to be comedians. We take a we take an oath that we won't engage in loud laughter. The penalty for which, by the way, is you have to cut your own throat to be forgiven of of breaking this this covenant that you make. So you laugh it, loudly. Yeah. Kill yourself. I would be, because when I was when I was a, a preacher. I would make people laugh when I would when I would when I would teach them. You know, when I would get up in front of the congregation. I would always try to make them laugh, and I would get I would get uh, called on the carpet by by my supervisors for doing that, and then they would point out the fact that that's just we don't do that. You know, we've taken a covenant to not do that. So I would push that down and push that down, but I would. I still knew how to play the, the ukulele when I came back from the Celtic trip, and so uh, you know I cr I still craved being in front of people, 
And so I would busk. I would go out on the street corner and play my ukulele and sing songs. And, uh, and then I would, I would tell little stories sometimes in between the songs and those would make people on the street corner laugh. And so that I think is the first time that I ever considered, well, maybe I'll be some sort of a comedian. And for the first year that I did stand up comedy, I brought a, a ukulele on stage with me. You know, I opened for Rob Schneider with a ukulele and, um, and then eventually stopped using the ukulele altogether. And for the last, you know, six years or so, I haven't used the ukulele. Yeah. I didn't need the ukulele. That wasn't my favorite part of it. Hmm. That's kind of cool. Like that the skill transferred. Yeah. Yeah. I still to this day don't know what any of those chords are called. I don't know. I have to look up on the internet if I'm going to tune it, you know, if, if it gets yeah. wildly out of tune, just to see what the string names are. And I don't know how to read any music for it, but, but I can figure out songs, but I play it beautifully. And I can, uh, and I can play most songs by ear. But I got it's no kind of similar. Yeah, it's kind of similar, like to people who go into comas and they wake up speaking a new language. Or I know there's yeah. this woman in the UK and she went into a coma and when she came out, she had a Polish accent. She'd never been to Poland, didn't speak any Polish. So yeah, they didn't have Polish no, friends. I got no explanation for that. Yeah, it, it fucks with me to this day. It should not be. You know, that's like that, that, and I tell stories about, about Tyler, about it being made up. And when I lived in Tyler, I would tell stories about the crazy things that I made up about my life as a Mormon. <laughs> so it just seems like, and if I, and also my life now, after the um, Salvia trip, though it's sequential and I can prove it all through newspaper clippings and my friends' uh, accounts of my life, my, it's a completely different life that I've had for the last 10 years since Salvia. It, it doesn't bear a moon cast shadow to the first 40 years. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. Do, do you talk about it on stage? No. You never talked about it on stage? No. Yeah, because it, it just sounds like awful. So. Yeah, I it's not funny it to me. I, I, if I get too high... I, if I'm telling somebody, I'll cry through part of it because it's just, it just, it was fucking horrible. You know, for I mean, me, it's are, not a funny story. Are you, are you upset now talking about it in any way? No, no, I'm okay. No, as long as you're okay, to be honest. I mean, I, uh, if if I that's if a I rough thing to talk get, about. If I start to get the weeps, it's not subtle. I'll just be, you know, I'll just dissolve into a mess. And have you ever gone and sought professional help? Uh, like, just think about it. Like, maybe you suffer from disassociate. I don't know, disassociating, whatever. I know there's an actual disorder when my head's wrecked. Yeah, my whole life since I was 14, I've been, I've been involved in, in talk therapy with, with, uh, with psychiatrists and psychologists. Okay. But yeah, I've well explored this with them. Okay. And what conclusions did they come to? That it was a, a psychedelic and it's a well-known effect of, of that psychedelic and you look yeah. it up on the internet and, and it's people having experiences just like Ari Shafir who's a who's a very uh, amazing comedian he did salvia and ha had this uh, and believed that he lived underwater in an underwater city for years you know so it's just it's your subconscious is going to give you whatever it thinks that you need and my subconscious probably felt that I needed I was probably in some sort of cognitive dissonance of uh, part of my subconscious probably knew that there were some issues with the, my Mormon faith. And uh, the reason that I probably had the, uh, this is what psychiatrists think, and the reason that I probably had the experience that I had is because I, I basically needed a nice long think about the direction that my life was going. And yeah. so it gave me one. I wasn't asking to like deb debunk what you're, what you're talking about, just to see yeah. like what, you've been told or how you've yeah. thought about it. That does make sense though, that you was kind of like, cause as a Mormon, you were restraining yourself from basic things that humans do, uh, things that everyone does. You were restraining yourself from taking part in these behaviors and then you got to go and do normal things, live mm -hmm. a normal life yeah. outside of the Mormon church. Uh, so that, that makes sense. 
Yeah. And I liked it and I wanted that for my family. Yeah. yeah. And I go on. And it wasn't quite, it did not end as quite, quite as ideally as I had imagined it, but they are all free of the Mormon church. Well, there you go. And do, do you not like the Mormon church at all? I, I, uh, I'm nostalgic for it. I don't believe it's true at all mm. anymore. And I am nostalgic for it in ways um, that uh, surprise me sometimes. I'll, I'll visit uh, my brother's home and they'll, they'll have some, you know, the, one of their many prayers of the day and I'll participate yeah. in it. And it's a, it's a good feeling. It's a homely, it's a homey feeling for me. But uh, it's a very demanding religion and it demands so much that it really kind of precludes itself from being taken casually, like some of the yeah. more, yeah. uh, some of the older, steadier religions. You know, you can, be a, you can be an Easter and Christmas Catholic, but if you try to be an Easter or Christmas Mormon, they will kick your ass right out. So. <laughs> yeah, especially with the more reformed uh, Christian religions or like branches of it, you, you can be pretty relaxed. Even which, with being a Catholic, you'd be pretty relaxed. Which is the kind of religion, if I was ever going to join another religion, it would have to be a religion like that. Mm. A religion that it does not need to be a cult. You know? And it's not trying to... It, the, the, the jaundiced way that I look at religion now, and the position that I'm in, that or at my most jaundiced point, is that religion seemed to... It seemed to me that the way religion worked is they... They make it against the rules to do something that you naturally would want to do. And then the people that are willing to stop, you know, whatever it is, masturbating or whatnot, will also be the people that will be willing to give you their money, which is what they yeah. really want. But some, some lay down, like, just basic rules of carry on, thou mm. shalt not kill. Right. They're all yeah. pretty much, you know, just don't be a dick. You know? Yeah, well, a lot of them are basically don't be a dick. And That's then there's good... some like small rules that were added in for no reason. Like in Christianity, you, you can't wear like clothes with two different Fabulous. two different materials in them. Like, yeah, I think we all kind of gloss over that. That's yeah. That's seriously a thing. I didn't know that. It is a thing. But you know, uh, a bit weird. Very Orthodox Jews, because that's in the Book of Leviticus. Very Orthodox Jews to this day still won't wear two different kinds of cloth. Because and 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 you and won't use a dish that has had meat on it to ever put anything that has cheese on it. So you have meat dishes and cheese dishes to this day with college educated people in the in the well, Orthodox Jewish religion. You know, Just because the book of Leviticus. Because there's a lot of people who would like to shit on religion. Uh, but you know it's it's a personal freedom. Leave people to do it. As long as it doesn't harm someone else, leave them to it. It was good for me, yeah. You know, I, as as much as I as I as I cry about it, it was good for me. You know, I learned things from being. Uh, you know, you act a different way when you think that there's an invisible man in the sky watching you than you do when you think that there's not. And mm -hmm. uh, and I learned a lot of discipline, and I learned a lot of self selflessness, and I learned how to take pleasure in in helping other people. And those are things that I probably could not have learned without religion. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Faith, faith can be important. Uh, it kind of depends on your. Yes. Yeah, it kind of depends on what you're being raised as, so on. Yeah. It, it, everyone's different. You know yourself. Yeah. And to a certain extent, existentially, we're all just trying to answer the question of where do we go when we die. Yeah. And yes. And there, and to a certain extent, the people that have told me, you know. The, I believe right now the working theory that I have is that this is a simulation or some sort of video game that we're playing. And what is that but religion for atheists? That's just mm -hmm. me trying to answer an existential question of what, I'm, what am I doing here? And what happens when this game is over? That's all that is. I have no, I have no information about that, but my brain wants to scurry away from the truth of being temporary or unimportant yeah. or something when someone asked you know? me like what what i think what happens when like with everything i, I just yeah. said like who knows 
And that's the thing. It's like nobody he, he does say who knows. It's not like nobody knows. knows. And it's like nobody has the answer. It's, it's, it's the only real thing you can It's a waiting say. game, you know? It's a waiting yeah. game. That's what life is. Yeah. And you what know, you if, this is, if this is a video game, and if this is a simulation, we've gone to extraordinary expense to make it so that we forget that it's a video game. So to a certain extent, me saying it's a simulation, it's a simulation, is akin to somebody standing up in a scary movie in a theater saying, don't worry, everybody. Monsters aren't real. It's just a scary movie, you know. So in some ways, I'm being a buzzkill. Maybe mm. I don't fucking know. Maybe the best. I guess the best thing that I've learned is I don't know. Yeah, That's yeah. The beauty of it, really. That is the you beauty. Take what you want away from it, you know. You believe what you uh, want. Do what ignorance you want. Ignorance is bliss. Exactly. But I hate that. You don't <laughs> like that at all, no. I mean, I the, when I was Mormon, I looked forward to the fact that at some point. I was going to die, and a loving God was going to put his arm around me and tell me what it was all about. And now, I Is have, that what I happens have... in the Mormon space? Yeah, essentially. Mm-hmm. You know at least that, that, that there's life after death, after you die, and you know it, and you have a life review. I think most Christians believe in a life review, or, or being able to see your sins or whatnot, or being judged for your life. And at, that, that point would be very instructive. And I looked forward to that day when I was Mormon. And it bugs the shit out of me that I'm never going to be debriefed, maybe. I don't know. Mm. I could very easily find my way back to religion. I don't know yeah. how, but I could have never predicted the zigs and zags my, my belief system has taken. So I, it would be foolish to try to predict that I never is a long time. Mm. Yeah. Definitely is a long time. But on a more positive note, you get pleasure out of making people laugh. You're stand-up comedian, yeah. so let's talk a little bit about about that. <laughs> On a lighter note, um, <laughs> you know yourself, yeah. Um, so you're doing it seven seven years. You said you opened for someone a ukulele before. It's very oh, Schneider. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. I've, I've, I've opened for a lot. I've opened for Dave Chappelle. I've opened for oh, wow. you know a lot of a lot of really good comics. It's awesome. Yeah, the, the great thing about comedy is there's very few comedians in the world. 99% of the people on the planet, you know, they fear public speaking more than they fear death. But for that strange 1% that, that it actually appeals to us, and then whatever portion of that 1% is actually funny, you know, it's, it, it boils down to where there's only a few hundred of us that are... Mm. You know, Let's talk a bit about, like, political correctness, because... Last night, I don't know if you saw it, that Bill Burr probably seen it. was on SNL. And he, yeah, yeah, it was, it was funny as fuck, you know? The guy's so a genius funny. in comedy. It was so but funny. like, people were trying to cancel him over his jokes. Which it's, was his point. He said he'd be cancelled for it because by the exact people he's talking about. Mm. Yeah. And to a certain extent, I mean, comedians have in some ways taken the place of philosophers and prophets in the Mormon, in, in the modern lexicon. You know, yeah. so what he's saying is funny because in a lot of people's mind, it's that electrified third rail of our society where you're not allowed to say that. And he's pointing out a very funny thing, which is, you know, it's popular to kick the shit out of white men for all of the for all of the things that we have done. But how easily white women have just stepped over that rope and are, you know, shaking their finger at white men just as hard as as anybody else and i think his point is is a just point you were part of that history come over sit beside me and take your talking to yep yeah i think that's i think that's great and i think a lot of of women needed to hear that strangely yeah i thought it's going to resonate with many people but it was funny um if it does resonate with you that's great yes because we know our crimes you you're very open about yours earlier uh yeah. or your ancestors at least well that's the thing yeah. I, I get very confused about like why are we giving out to someone for color of their skin when you, you don't choose that like if my ancestors were the, the vikings and they went and pillaged and killed and all sorts of all sorts of things you're not going to be giving out to me about it like it's not my fault no i mean all of our ancestors for the last thousands of years 
it was a it was a very common thing to everybody gets a fucking sword and you meet on the edges of a of a little uh, prairie someplace and everybody runs into the clearing and hacks each other to pieces with the town fucking next to yours and that was how we settled yeah. our differences that is in a very happens. violent way uh, all of our ancestors were probably wonderful but really terrible people you know and just they yeah. were by by today's society they'd be monsters yeah like only in the last hundred years that we said like hold on now a second and even at that we had uh we had the great war uh yeah. and then the cold to blow each other up um yeah. ireland's been very happy in those little areas because no one ever wants to fight ireland like what do you want shamrocks pot of gold <laughs> you want me lucky charms <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, actually, that's there one thing I'm very grateful for. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing I'm very grateful for. Ireland's one of the safest countries in the world. Yeah. Like Swiss thing of like neutrality, no matter what. Don't even have an army. We have a defense yeah. force, but it's kind of a show. And our, my country's gone completely the other direction. You know, they're trying to be the police force of the whole fucking world. You know, we, we've got a bigger military in the US than all the other nations of the world combined. Wrong. Which is a, a bit of a, a bit of overkill. China, and I bet you guys. China's have you yeah. beaten for the last five ish years. Yeah. Mm. Well we're we're itching for a we're itching for that football match in some ways. <laughs> yeah. Well in all fairness, you guys have secured some peace deals in the Middle East, which is great because it's a bit of chaos at the moment. It, it's it's yeah. good that these areas are getting Back to normal. Like you guys have done a lot of good. You've done some bad. You've done. You've done bad. Soviet Union did worse, but you guys, you know, you guys are doing okay. You know. Yeah. Well, you know. Compared to China, you, you guys are pretty nice. Yeah. Mm. I mean, it's, it's it's a funny old fucking world, you know, because we're all yes. so the the economies are so interdependent with each other now. That it really makes absolutely no sense to blow each other off the map. The thing that, that makes our relationship with China so robust is the fact that if they ever killed us, they would go bankrupt. Huh. You know, and if we ever killed them, we'd starve. Yeah. You know, and so we're interdependent in that way where almost every mention of war or every threat, it's kind of just bluster, meaningless bluster. Yeah, you know, the, the, once we realized what we had done by arming ourselves nuclearly, uh, I think once we had a couple generations to think about that, or maybe just one generation to think about that, I think that might have ended the worst parts of war. Yeah, to a certain extent, because it can get so fucking bad in a in a minute that we might as well just be each other's best customers business mm. in some strange way yeah. greed may actually save us in international conflicts basically going to be gone regional conflicts they're going to be here for a while there, there's yeah. some stuff that needs to be sorted uh oh, like yeah. countries having certain parts of other countries that they shouldn't really have like i know estonia is still slightly occupied by russia yeah uh, obviously we don't have northern ireland the people have different feelings about that um you know the United Kingdom having the Falklands uh, and then Gibraltar in Spain. Yeah. There's all these little things that are just getting sorted out, but uh, hopefully we find better ways than just the sticks and the stones. Yeah. Well, in my lifetime, it's gone, it's, it's, everything has really changed. I mean, Great Britain, Britain used to have India in my lifetime, you know, and, uh, and um, Taiwan and just, you know, there was just, uh, Things, things were just in my lifetime things have really changed and in your lifetime you won't be able to recognize this world it, it and everything is getting gentler thank god if you look at it with the right perspective over the last thousands of years it's the, human beings have become far more gentle than they yeah. ever have been at any time that in our lifetime that well in any time of our written history that we currently have also, we're finding out the world is much, much older than we thought it was, you know? Mm. Yeah. We've probably destroyed ourselves or been destroyed many, many times. Yeah. Uh, and actually, one thing that I found interesting is, like, civilizations falling. Like, Rome lasted for a very long time. And then, just gone. 
Uh, if you want, if you want to be very technical, they're still kind of around. Uh, Turkey kind of claimed to be them when they were the Ottomans. They took over Constantinople and said that they're the heirs of the Roman Empire. And then before that, it was Byzantium that went away in like the 1400. Yeah. Yeah. But human beings are so smart, though, that civilization can move very, very quickly uh, when we have enough food. So from the time that we invented the airplane until we used an airplane to drop an atomic bomb on Japan was Twice. 50 years. 50 years from riding horses to dropping atomic bombs on people. Mm. Yeah. So we could, and, and this earth has been around for, you know, millions of years. How, how, how many times is there time in that timeline to have destroyed ourselves? Yeah. Because every time there's an ice age, the ice grinds everything on the planet down to a fine paste. There would be no, you could have skyscrapers and vistas and, you know, mm. fine cars and you have an ice age and you cover the, all the land masses with a, with a mile thick, you know, sh shell of, of ice. There's going to be no evidence of it. Well, no need to worry about that anymore. According to David Attenborough, we leave the ice age in 2030. Uh, like we're, we're we're really going up that way. Like we're technically still in it as long as there's ice on the planet yeah. for the entire year or whatever. And he says we're going to be out of that soon. And in 2030, the Amazon rainforest will become the Amazon savanna. Yeah. It'll run out of moisture and it'll eventually turn into a savanna. Yeah. And the ocean levels Good. will rise 30 feet globally. Yeah. And most of the cities that we know and love are, you know, operate We'll, we'll be underwater. Thankfully, we live in the center of Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Even though we we're start, tiny. We're actually in like the lowest lands of Ireland as well. Mm. Yeah. That's not good. Yeah, we're going to be like number <laughs> one. <laughs> Here's another trippy thing that will happen. So there's a giant uh, suspension of ice in Antarctica. And at some point, they can tell that things are going to melt there enough where that where a continent sized piece of ice is gonna drop into the ocean. And when that does, it's gonna raise the, 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 the Earth's water surfaces by 10 feet instantaneously, essentially at the speed of gravity. So it's not even a wave that will go, just the displacement is gonna make all, the, all of the water go up. And we all just drive our cars around just bliss, blissfully ignorant of that can happen at any moment. We well, could just be driving down the freeway and then find ourselves swimming. Hey, we started a challenge today if you want to take part. <laughs> what are you going to do? Uh, we challenged 10 people to plant a tree. Uh, and then the, the idea is they challenged 10 more people. Uh, we planted an apple One tree? tree today. One tree. One tree. Apple tree right, is what I'll we did. Pull. All right, I'll plant a tree. You got to challenge 10 people. Fuck though. yeah. <laughs> All right. My I'll man. take that challenge. <laughs> uh, actually, I was telling Thomas, I was watching the new David Attenborough documentary and I got pretty upset during it because of how much sadness there was in the guy. Like, you, you could tell he's basically given up. And for someone like him who's been talking about it his entire life, that's rough. He's talked about it his entire fucking life. Born in 1907. And in 2020, yeah. he's still talking about it. I mean... Most old men are sad because they see they, they, they see that they almost get filled with this feeling of futility of of, of who we are, you know. Mm. Yeah, I've seen I people like, like call him like all sorts of names. Like he's been called racist, a new colonialist, all these things. I feel, I feel terrible for the guy. He's just like, yeah. let's plant some trees, let's preserve ecosystems, and then people are like, no, 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 you bad. Yeah, well, at least he wasn't friends with David, you know, with Jeffrey uh, Epstein. Oh, thank God. Yeah, well, thank the Lord. That we know. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think we should wrap it up. Cause... I think we should. We have another <laughs> mm, person okay. on fairly soon. Mm. Um, man, this was a pleasure. It I was. Wanna, thank you. I want to do a second part to this sometime, if you'd be up for that. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Yeah. And, and there's, you know, watch the Netflix is... Uh, 
that you know they're they're somebody's somebody just recorded this and they're animating that the salvia story and uh, uh, so there's another documentary company that's that's making a series about the um, my business partner you know murdering people so uh, what's this all know. about here with the Netflix series what's it called so, so there's there's a there's an animated version of this uh, of the Salvia story that they just filmed a few weeks ago, and it's being animated now, and that will come out next year. That's awesome. And the, and the, a, a true crime series about the witness protection story will come out sometime next year. Yeah, because you, you're yeah, an interesting guy. You, you've had an interesting life, man. Like I'm I'm glad that's going to be out there for me to watch. Mm. Thank you. We may talk when those are out. What do you reckon? Yeah, great. Yeah, reach out, reach out to me anytime. Awesome. Of course. Thank just you wanna, so much. I just want to thank Out of the Blank Podcast for yeah, sh- the shout guest out of the producer. blank. Because last yeah. time we didn't thank him and he shouted at us over the phone. So <laughs> <laughs> love yeah. you, man. <laughs> yeah, thank you right. so much for getting on. Uh, thanks to thanks him for guys. getting us in contact with you. And look, have a great day. Uh, to everyone who watched or listened, uh, thank you so much. Make sure to like, comment, subscribe. Maybe tell your grandma about the podcast. She might like it. I take it handy. All right.